While everybody is uh, coming on in, introducing themselves, let me welcome everybody to the top of the hour and this week's Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's host. I'm its cat herder, creator, and your guide to the next hour of conversation. I'm delighted to see you all here today because I'm especially excited about this week's dynamic and wonderful guest. Now, ever since we've been doing the Future Trends Forum, so almost six years now, uh, we've been focusing on teaching, on how to improve teaching, on what good teaching is. And we've hit this from a variety of angles. Today, I'm especially excited to welcome one of the world's great thinkers, practitioners, and overall inspiring people on this subject. Jose Antonio Bolin has been many things. He's a terrific jazz musician, an accomplished scholar, a university president, a consultant, and just a general brilliant person to get in trouble with. Uh, he's really famous for his first, uh, the book with the first title, Teaching Naked, as well as a sequel. And just now, he's coming with a new book on teaching change from Johns Hopkins University Press. And this is about how to change teaching as well as how to teach students how to change their minds and to think more clearly. Now, let me bring Jose Bone up on stage so that he can join us and we can learn more. Greetings, sir. Hi, Brian, how are you? Can good. you hear me? Really, I can hear you just perfectly. How are you doing, sir? Things are good. I'm glad to be here. It's really an honor. Well, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, and I gather you're coming to us from your home office in Dallas, Texas. Yep, yep, we're living in Dallas now. It has great airports. We like it here. Oh, good, good. We have more than a few Texans among the crowd, so I'm glad to see you there. Listen, Jose, I, there's so many ways for me to talk about you and tell people about you, but I'd rather you tell them about yourself through a specific angle. Tell people what you're going to be working on for the next year. What are the big projects or what are the big ideas that are top of mind? Yeah, so I this... This book um, was going to really. I wanted this to be the nudge book. So I had been interested in this mm -hmm. idea of of nudges uh, and things that we can do to help students right do the work that only they can do. Uh, and so choice architecture. So things like uh, when you send students a text, right? Would they opt in? And rather than saying, "Would you like to get email from us?" saying, um, "You're getting email from us unless you opt out." Right. Uh, things like when I send a text that says, "Would you like help with financial aid?" That's, that's good, but it's much better to say, um, would you like help with financial aid? Click here. The student has oh. to actually do something, yes or no. Um, and so that work overlaps with a lot of the work I did for, for teaching change, you know, thinking about how do I get, how do you get people to vote more, uh, lose mm -hmm. weight, stop mm -hmm. smoking, floss more, whoever thought mm -hmm. there's a e, you know, mobile health journals. Um, but it ended up the book was too long anyway, so we split it. So so I was going to do this um, as a there's a separate sort of book on just the nudges and the, the kind of the big institutional things. And this book ended up being about the, more about the classroom and about the, the psychology of teaching change. Um, but then I got sidetracked because, of course, the last two years have happened. And so I'm actually writing a short book on inclusive teaching. Um, because that's what I've been other than right, the things I was asked to do in the last year, right? Help faculty pivot to online. Uh, and and do, and talk about inclusive teaching. And so there are lots of people who are talking about the specific part of, you know, how do you have difficult conversations? How do you talk about race? What's an anti-racist? But I wanted to, to talk about well, all good teaching is inclusive teaching. You, if you're not an inclusive teacher, you're not a good teacher. So I wanted to talk to the math people and the STEM people and the people who say, well, I just teach content and I, you know, and say, well, no, but a uh, uh, a better syllabus and more rubrics are going to help. I, I love this idea from, from John Powell called targeted universalism, mm -hmm. which is that what you really want to do is think about ways that I can do things that won't hurt anybody, but they can, their, their greatest benefit is to people uh, who either don't know the rules or have some other issue. Uh, so, uh, you know, a great, a great idea is, is uh, ATM machines. Right, the first ATM machines, more people made mistakes. They had smaller buttons. Somebody made the buttons oh. bigger. Oh. Right, so nobody is harmed by that, but people who are visually impaired are get the most benefits. So it's targeted. Right. It's also called universal design. Uh, mm -hmm. But I like the idea of targeted universalism because the targeted piece means I think about what should I do for first generation students that won't be obvious to them. That's obvious to me because I live here. And I need to make clear for them. And so, so 
Uh, so that's actually what I'm going to do uh, the next year. And then I'll come back to nudges because the truth is, right, fewer people deal with systems of things like, you know, email reminders and, and, and lighting, dorm room lighting. It's just not as interesting to lots of people. But the truth is, if you really wanted to improve student learning, uh, right. I, I, you know, I, we built these weird, crazy dorms when I was at Goucher right? and we thought about, right, they're smaller rooms. They're double. They're narrower. They're right. The further you are from the bathroom is yeah. as a freshman, the first semester, the more likely you are to graduate on time. That's not just Goucher data. That's national data. You make more friends. Right. Relationships. Um, right. If you're next to the bathroom, you go back and forth. Or if you're in a single. Right. You don't meet as many people. Quads actually are even better. But that's a harder sell. But things like like blue light, right? So you should turn off all the blue light in all of your dorm rooms at you know ten o'clock at night, especially right. if you have eight o'clock classes because right. they're not going to get enough sleep. And so when you don't get enough sleep, you think everybody's out to kill you. Literally, right? We have right. Think about it. You're, you're you wake in the middle of the night. You're in the savanna. You're in the jungle. You get mm. woken up. You're you're mm. right. I don't have time to go friend or foe. No, the default is everybody's a foe. And so. Um, the whole, all sorts of things are related to sleep. So there's actually a lot about sleep in the nudge book. But anyway, you asked me what I was doing, and that's not this book, but that's the next one. <laughs> the next book. That's right. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's great. Um, oh, we're looking forward to seeing that. Uh, well, you know well. how it is. Your head, your head's always in the next space. It's like you know, this book I wrote, I finished six months ago. It's like what? What's in that book? <laughs> that's a long time. Well, that's why it's a book. You can always go back to it. Friends, I'm going to ask uh, Jose just a couple more questions, but the forum is here for your questions. Uh, the forum is here for you to share your thoughts and your requests. Um, and Jose, as you can tell, will be glad to answer them. And like almost no other guest on the forum, I can say he can riff on your questions. The uh, one question to ask is, uh, you, you have this great, great model in the first part of the book, first third of the book, uh, where you talk about the importance of rethinking our memory uh, in terms of organizing our memory and how we search and find things. You have this great metaphor first of a closet, that our memory is this giant closet that we organize, and everybody organizes it differently. So you have these good tips for professors, for instructors in general, on how to get students to surface their own categories. But then we also look into this closet, not with a broad view, but with this narrow beam flashlight. So you ask us to you know, train ourselves to use that flashlight really well. I'm, I hope I'm not mangling this so far, but can you just speak a little bit about that metaphor? I was blown away by it. I thought it was so elegant and powerful. Uh, well, I wish I'd invented it, but it's borrowed from lots of other psychologists who do, you know, work on you know, cognitive load and memory. And so, but yeah, you've got it right. The, the, the analogy for the brain, right? The brain is not a computer, right? You know, we, uh, in fact, we always use like new technologies. So the 18th century, they thought brains were like clocks or about machines or whatever. And so, um, so the brain is really like a giant closet. And so when stuff comes in, you organize it. And so, you know, uh, my wife organizes shoes in one way. Your, your closet is set up by, you know, function and color, uh, you know, heels are over here. And, and my, you know, closet is organized, you know, the, the tennis shoes are here, the soccer, sh you know, and it's like, I don't care what color they are. Uh, you know, I guess I have black and brown. Uh, and, you know, in fact, one of my editors, somebody, somebody in the process said, well, but, but don't you, don't you have to wear white shoes for tennis? And I said, not anymore. And I said, but that that tells me what's in your clock, right? That tells me that you organize things in a certain way, right. and that's generational. So everybody right. has a different organization. So you've got to know, and you know, um, uh, you know, if I'm talking to a chef about fish, and I say, you know, uh, this new fish is like, you know, opaka opaka, and they go, oh yeah, I know what that's like, and or it's a little bit like halibut, but it's like no, let's come like turbo. But it's like I don't know what any of those things mean. I'm right. I'm an expert. <laughs> And I'm speaking to you as a student and the novice is going, you know, I don't have any of those signposts. So as a teacher, all of us do this, right? We start talking up here and realize, you know, and my, the, the way this, the way I actually understood that I, I realized this. So I had a video game I had designed for students to learn how to tell, you know, the difference between Dizzy Gillespie and Louis Armstrong, you know, Miles Davis, et cetera. And so they had, you know, you click on the, you know, you listen to the sample and who's playing the trumpet. And this poor kid come and so you know there's several levels of this and so you have to get to level nine to get an a right because they're like they're 10 levels or you know, and so you keep playing the game all semester long um and this poor kid comes to me and says professor what's what's a trumpet 
Right, right. Is that different than a banjo? And it's like, oh, of course. Right. I just assume everybody knows the difference. And so it's like, so I created new levels. This is a clarinet. This is a banjo. This is a trumpet. And then this is the difference between a trumpet and trombone. And once, until you can tell the difference between trumpet and trombone, don't even try to tell the difference between Miles Davis and Louis Armstrong. Right. So we always start as experts and we have and it's also memory is easy for us because we have all these connections right? things are connected. And my favorite is that you know, I remember the green album at the end of the row right? that has that song I like on it. Yeah. And that's yeah. The, and you know, Google is good at a lot of things and, you know, iTunes and but it's not good at that. It can't tell me play the song that's on the green album at the end of the row. But yeah. that's actually how the brain works. And so. So on the one hand, all of our organizational system is different, but we also don't have overhead lighting. We have this little flashlight. And so, you know, in music, I taught my music students for years, what are the, what's, what's the first word of pay attention, right? Pay, <laughs> it costs something. So if you're asking people to pay attention, you have to realize that that's, they're having to give up something else to do it. And so when our, we tell our students, I want you to pay attention to this. Well, the first thing is, is it worth it? And the human brain is designed to reject most stimuli, right? Um, we, we are, there's just too much coming at us. In fact, I had an anthropologist tell me that, that if we actually processed all the information that would come in, we'd need a brain the size of a house and our neck mm -hmm. couldn't support it. Mm -hmm. So we, we gave up that for mobility because being mobile is a little bit better for survival. So we have what, you know, Daniel Kahneman called system one and system two, right? Mm -hmm. We have a fast system that says, reject, reject, reject. And the best way to think about this is when you're reading email, you could read every word, but right. nobody does, right? And, but if it's an article about you, you read, right? All of a sudden your attention is engaged. You're, hi, this is an article about me, I read, right? And so you're, you have a rational brain in there that can pro fully process all the information, but you don't use it most of the time. Most of the time you're in the store and it's like nine ninety nine. that's cheaper than 10. And it's like, you know, yeah. that's not, yeah, but, but you do it. And so that's also one of the things I learned, about, right? Going to the grocery store is, is, is choice overload. You are not in a good mood. Do, do not try to study or work when you go to the grocery store, because it's lots of little inconsequential choices. Mm -hmm. Your cognitive load is now depleted. Your emotional bandwidth is depleted. Uh, so you're now going to get more tense when you can't do a math problem, right? So, so those are the kinds of things that, that I mean, understanding the big picture about who the, how the human brain works allows us to start thinking about redesigning the process of education and redesigning our classrooms so that we're considering, well, why would they be paying attention? What are they paying attention to? So... Uh, I think those are the, the those are, that's the big picture of where to start, and it's I've focused in this book on how teaching change is really really hard. Uh, and again, if you want to get people to to vote more, to lose weight, stop smoking, you know, those are big changes. And so there's a lot of research on what works and what doesn't work. And the first thing, not a surprise to anybody, right? You want to change your behavior, you want to go to the gym more. You need friends who go to the gym more, right? You want students to study more. Right. Actually, roommate selection matters that if your roommate studies more, you will study more. And what's interesting is that your roommate is is it affects your behavior, but only in the ways that you can see. So that if your roommate is having like, you know, lots of sexual partners with that, you, you know, that's not in the room, it doesn't change your behavior. Right. But if you can see your roommate studying, you go, wow, that, that person is maybe I should be studying more. Um, and so like anything else, you want to study more, get friends that study more. Um, you want to study more, make an appointment with yourself, right? What's called the implementation effect, right? So not just how many hours a week you're going to study this week, but when and where. Put it into your phone so that you get a, a reminder that says at seven o'clock, you're supposed to be in the library. The data on this, there's a ninefold increase. Ninefold. Oh my God. What else do we do with a ninefold increase? In the yeah. people who actually study the now on Tuesday at seven o'clock, because you said you were going to study three hours, but now, so, so part of the book is about, you know, those sorts of techniques. And part of the book is about, uh, you know, things that we do in classroom to make discussion better, uh, to create more That's resilience, good. that sort of stuff. Which is great. I, I mean, every chapter has stacks of, of, of tips and, and practices. But before I say anything more, there are, there are questions coming in. 
And I want to make sure that people get to ask that. So Charles Finley uh, asks, hang on one second. I'll try that again. Charles Finley asks, inclusive teaching, how do we nudge learners to help us see where we are not inclusive or overlooking them? Great. Well, well, thanks, Charles. So the first thing is, you know, do is, is the tone of syllabus matters, right? The, the way that you set up your e-communication policy and, and literally tone of voice. So, in, for example, there's a study that says instead of saying students will, you know, your learning outcomes, just saying we will changing a simple word changes. Oh, well, I'm more I'm more likely to ask for help now. So when you ask when you do a pre-class survey or you do a survey two or three weeks in, just the fact that you're doing it says that you care and students are like they're more likely to say stuff. And so a pre-class survey is good, uh, but this, I got to give a, a Bonnie Stahoviak credit for this because, you know, I, I, she we always a lot of us do these pre-class surveys, but her question is a brilliant one. When she started saying, tell me when you do your best work as a pre-class survey, because, right, I'm asking about you <laughs> and, and right, we're all more willing to talk about ourselves. So rather than what do you know about my subject, what are the things that you right? How do you do your best work? How could I help you do your best work? That's a much more inviting question to students. Yeah. Um, you can then ask, you know, what do you know about my subject? Um, but for the most part, asking students, you know, what's working, what's what's not working, um, uh, and you know, and also having private conversations. So if you're face to face, that means you know, in the hallway, I stand at the doorway, you know, both on the way in and the way out or at least I used to before, you know, COVID made it, oh, I got to give you six feet. But, right, but I would learn names on the way in and on the way out, you know, are there anything I can help you with? I get just the effort of doing that. Students are more likely to say, well, I'm confused about this. Um, mm. And and if you really want to go whole hog, really the best way to do this is to have children and send them to college and have them talk to you. Because uh, I learned so much when my daughter went to college. And my, I'll tell one, only one story was that she texts me one night, because of course she's not gonna call and says, Dad, Dad, what why why do some professors only assign the odd number of problems? It's like, well, uh, maybe the answers to the even ones are in the back, or maybe one they want to give you half as many, or they're they're trying to be nice. No, Dad, tell me the truth. What's really going on? It's like cons you think there's a conspiracy? I mean, right, and your dad's a college professor, and you've been in this world for your whole life. And you're confused about, uh, and I, so, right? It never occurred to me that somebody might see only do the odd numbered problems and think we were scheming for something. It's like, what? Yep. So, you know, so the truth is, I, I, we live here. And so, my the, the way to think about it for me is imagine how you feel when you go to the gym, right? And you have some fitness instructor with, you know, the with the big muscles and the tank top, and you're going, you like the gym too much. Like you do push-ups for fun, right? You, you just think this is great. It's like, I need, I need, my, I want to go home. I need motivation. I'm not going to spend my whole life in here doing push-ups. But that's what students see when they look at us, right? They see somebody who loves the library so much or, or loves school so much. We never wanted to leave. We look like that big muscly guy at the gym who's a fitness instructor. And so we've got to, you know, we have to assume that, that we like school and it worked for us. That it doesn't actually work for most people. They just want to graduate and get out of here. And so it's a mindset in my view. I hope that helps, Charles. Oh, it's a great question, Charles. And I love how you, uh, I love how your answer as it really just uh, shows and, and emphasizes us caring uh, and how, what a big difference that makes. Uh, there are more questions coming in. Uh, one from Tom Hames, just down the road from you, Jose, uh, near, uh, near Houston. Uh, and Tom asks, how did pandemic teaching impact your view of teaching? Or not? Oh, so the pandemic. So, well, okay. So the easy answer is we've all learned that students like chat, right? And that, in fact, there was a study that just came out today, a Danish study, I think, that that said students are more engaged in online learning than in face-to-face -face lectures. And that was not a great headline because what they really found was that students ask more questions in on right, because the chat is easier. The bar is lower. I can say, wait, I don't understand. Um, I mm -hmm. use something called Go Soapbox, which has a, a confusion barometer, and students just have to click the confused. And so when that goes red, I say, oh, right. And so uh, now in the face-to-face, -face, I was looking around the room, right? Good teachers. I always say good teachers teach to the middle, right? Video yeah. games yeah. teach to individuals because a video game can get hard, right? If it's too easy, it gets harder. If it's too hard, it gets easy, right? Video games adapt to each individual in ways that we just can't do. 
So a good teacher looks around and goes, okay, everybody looks confused. I'm going to slow down. Everybody looks bored. I'm right. We, we make adjustments, but online, the students can send us things. They can chat. So one of the things I'm still trying to figure out the right platform, but I think going back into the, the face-to-face classroom, especially in larger classrooms, you've got to have a back channel. So on my website at teachingmaker.com under borrow, I've got a whole page full of different, you know, different types of back channels. What works for this? What does that, you know, word clouds. Um, so those sorts of things are engaging. Again, we have new study today that says they are more engaging. And so I think that's going to stick. Uh, and so I think it also convinced a lot of us that we could do things we didn't think we could do, right? That we could change. That faculty develop faculty development really matters, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. That we, we, faculty are hungry for this. And that given the opportunity, in this way, we were forced, we say, oh, actually, this is a better way to teach, or are there are better things I can do in this environment? And so what we've noticed from students and faculty alike is that some people loved it, some people hated it, some people never want to go back to the physical class, both, both teachers and students, um, and some students can't wait. But I think that expectations have been changed for good, right? The number one thing students say they want is the ability to watch um, asynchronously. Right. They mm-hmm. want everything that's live taped, taped, the old guy says. Whatever <laughs> yeah. Really, right. So that they can they can write the convenience of being able to do it. And I don't think we're going to get away from that. I, I absolutely think that students have tasted. Conv- right. They've 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 tasted the Chick-fil-A and the McDonald's and the Burger King. And they've had the, they've had the drive through. They're not going to want to get, at, I mean, it's, and I, I'm one of those people who's, I, I never go to the drive-thru. I don't understand. But I see these people lined up in the drive-thru and I think, I'm just going to get out of my car and walk in. But right, the, the truth is, there's a market for it. And so yeah. Yeah. students are going to want that convenience of, and so I think both individual faculty and institutions are going to be under continued pressure to offer more modalities and, and simultaneous modalities, which by the way, is the hardest and worst form of teaching. I'm I'm totally opposed to high flex because I can't do both face to face. I mean, it's just it's that's the I think that's the hardest environment. And so I think the better way to do it is to say I have an hour for this and I have an hour for face to face, but I'm huh. not going to do them simultaneously. And in fact, one of the models that I proposed at the very beginning of the pandemic was that people who were teaching multiple sections not teach multiple sections of high flex, right? You're teaching Monday, Wednesday, Friday, nine right. and 10. Yeah. Do a giant Monday session where everybody is face to face and then tape it and that's the, that's the lecture. And then do online sections where you do either online or face to face and everybody is in one or the other. But I think I think there are ways to do, you know, 20 students in my in my face to face classroom and then 20 students an hour later online. But trying to do it all at once is a disaster. Uh, so I think that's going to be a huge change. And I and I've certainly you know changed my own teaching in response to all of those things. Breakout rooms. Hey, and, and the new feature where students can choose. This is even right. The, so Zoom made us in the first part of the pandemic. There are 10 big breakout rooms that I'm assigning you and you have to go. But that can then mix you, mix you up. That's cool. But under the new breakout rooms on Zoom, you can say, okay, so those of you who have had very little experience with uh, fighter planes, you go over here. Those of you who love to talk about football, go over here. And I can label the rooms and then students can join the room where people want to use the analogy or metaphor that, right, that they want to use. So those, we're going we're gonna to try to talk about this idea using one of these metaphors. And so all the soccer guys are over here and all the baseball people, right? And so that that's, I can do that in a classroom. I'd have to have signs and people get to yeah, move around. Yeah. But there are some things that, that I figure, ooh, this works better online and I've changed my teaching. And so now the question is, how do I bring those things back into the classroom uh, when we go face to face, or how do I say, you know what, we're gonna do, we're gonna do hybrid, but it means we're gonna have a special session tonight that's only online. Uh, and I think we'll see more of that. We had a quick clarifying question from uh, Denise Roy, who asks, uh, "Which version of High Flex are you referring to?" And I, I, I thought I thought Denise it was the the combination of face to face and online uh, in the same spot. Is is that it? 
Yeah. So, I mean, High Flex was designed at San Francisco for very, very specific, you know, purposes mm -hmm. and people were trained to do it. But the idea that a lot of campuses rolled, in fact, you know, what I thought was hilarious, right? Everybody rolled out there. It's Oklahoma High Flex. It's the Texas High Flex. It's like, no, it's just High Flex. And, and not even, it's not even that. It's just, we're going to offer students the choice of being in class or being online. And so we're going to set up a camera in the classroom and you're going to have three kids in the classroom and nine kids online and some monitors. And so that's the high flex that again, was not well developed by most institutions. Uh, and for the, for most, the most part, it made, made life harder. Mm. Uh, and and mm. I think less good. And I think there are, you can do a high flex model where, you, like I said, you do Monday at nine, I do this, I do face to face, and Monday at ten, I do online, and so both groups are getting things that, that are that are, and it's just easier to teach that way, in my view. It's kind of like lecture and discussion sections. Yeah, although I think you could do the like if you're going to do a lecture, then just tape the whole thing and don't do any face to face. I agree. Just, I agree. Just tape that yeah. sucker. Put it online, yeah. watch it when you want. And then I can do discussion sections that are some discussions are face to face and some discussions are are online. But in that case, it's like I have I have sections and you can come to more than one. You can whatever. There, there are ways to do that. Even if you're just teaching Monday, Wednesday, Friday, nine o'clock, you could still do right. that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree completely. Um, I, I forget who it was who said that uh, watching a giant lecture is distance learning. Um, yeah. Um, Quick, uh, well, uh, friends, uh, I have a couple more questions, but we, we're here for you. We'd love to hear from your thoughts. Uh, in the chat, people are talking about different forms of high flex. People are asking questions, uh, and I'd love to, uh, to share them with you. Um, uh, in fact, as I say that, Valerie Wheat has one. We just published this. Uh, Valerie says, what advice do you have for engaging students in completely asynchronous courses? We have a lot of students who are very interested in self-paced learning, but we still want them to engage with others. Uh, Valerie's uh, coming to us from uh, Jefferson. Um, where is it? I'll put this back up so you guys can see it. No, Jefferson, okay, I got it. Yeah. Thanks, Valerie. Yeah. So, uh, so first is that I do think there is some advantage to having some synchronous. So for students who want the convenience of asynchronous, that's good. If you, but I mean, I say, look, so we're going to do. I'm going to do an hour on Tuesday night. You know, or I'm going to do. I'm going to one hour a week. But here's what I'm going to do in that hour. And here's why it's different, because we're going to learn from each other. We're going to like shit like we're just doing right here. We're going to have a chance to hear multiple voices at once. And that's different. Uh, and so I think there is some case to be made for convincing students that we should occasionally have some some synchronous time as long as we use it well. In some ways, it's not not unlike the model I talked about in Teaching Naked. That is, if you're going to have synchronous face-to-face -face classrooms and students are going to have to drive, pay for parking, you're going to have air conditioning. Yeah. You better do something more than you could. I could have watched at home online in my underwear. So, uh, but the other thing is that asynchronous does allow people to be more thoughtful in a way, to think more slowly, to get research, to do things in advance. So, I think there's a different type of discussion when it's asynchronous. So, I do think it matters to say, you know, you need to post three times a day, four times a week, whatever it is. Uh, you need to post in two different threads. Um, at least one of those posts needs to have some other research you're bringing into the discussion. So I think for both face-to-face -face discussion and synchronous discussion and asynchronous, we assume that students know the rules and they don't. And so I think spending more time, what makes a good comment, right? I, one of my favorite discussion techniques is before, every comment has to begin with what I liked about the previous speaker was... Well, dot, 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 and, or there's a previous comment I want to connect with, and it's this, and make a connection. So, right, connections are valued. Um, so another way to do, to add that, you know, in face-to-face -face classrooms, I sometimes do inner, inner circle and outer circle, where the outer circle arrives, you know, gives awards points to the inner circle based upon a rubric. So for the next 10 minutes, we're looking for divergent ideas, right, not convergent. And we're going to, you can award points to the most divergent ideas. You do the same thing online. So asynchronous. So you've got one. So group, you know, can you award points to each other? So now the engagement is double. It's what do I say? But also, oh, that's a good comment. And that then leads to a whole separate meta discussion about which comments are good, which are useful and why. Uh, so students are now engaged at multiple levels. Um, with that. The other thing about asynchronous is that, right, asynchronous is easier for, right, the world is happening all around us. So what is happening in the world that you want to bring in right now? 
uh, because you're you're living out there now. And so, I, you know, I would I'm more encouraging of that asynchronously uh, to have students say, uh, what are the relevant problems? What are some applications? You know, I like I do a Twitter assignment where it's, you know, tweet, you know, once what, twice a week with this hashtag. But apply what we learned in class to something that, you know, so you have to you know, provide a link or an example of something that happened outside of class and that everybody can see them and comment on them. And that that's obviously an asynchronous exercise. So the Twitter assignment links the real world to the class real world. Very yeah. nice. And it works both both in class and it works out of class. You know, you're watching the Super Bowl. What techniques did those advertisements show? Um, yeah. Yeah. That kind of, you know, you're, 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 cause then you're applying it because again, the problem is that it's the same reason we don't offer, you know, Spanish class for five hours on Monday in a seminar and then you don't do it for the, right. We want a little bit every, you forgetting is part of learning. So you want to forget, learn, forget, learn. It's, it's why highlighting is also a bad study technique, but quizzing and flashcards is good, but you don't, but cramming is bad, right? Cause you want to do a little bit at a time. And so you know, tweeting at a student or getting them to do something at three o'clock in the morning, that's a little bit at a time. And it's like, oh, I have to remember. The metaphor for me is you got to go back in the closet. The more times you go back in and out of the closet, the better. And if you just, you know, live in the closet in this space the whole time, you don't get the same benefit that you do from making the path, right? Where, where is that? Where is it? Oh, I you know it's over here. And even if you make a mistake, right, it's, it's feedback. It's immediate feedback so my other favorite analogy is that the best teacher in the world is the tennis net the te the coach is useful sometimes but sometimes you just need more balls right it's like the tennis net provides immediate feedback that's non-judgmental right it's not a d minus or an a plus it's just balls Let's go over, over the net goes over doesn't go over let's try again but if the ball's not going over i got feedback that says you better correct i better do something else and so Man, if we could have classrooms that had tennis nets, <laughs> say, here's another bucket, right? Try a few more balls and you're going to get that immediate feedback. So, but that's right. Non judgmental and immediate feedback is what people need. Um, and so, the reason asynchronous is often less engaging is because I'm only the one here. So, the more ways to get students to respond to each other quickly, right, and get feedback, it's why Facebook works, right? The dopamine hit, I got likes. So mm -hmm. are there ways to, you know, to build that into asynchronous? So asynchronous environments that have things like likes for all of the negative of them, they are engaging. Do you, okay, first of all, first of all, that's a terrific response. Valerie, <laughs> that's, uh, that's a great question. If you'd like to uh, follow up, either uh, post a, another question, or in fact, let me just do this. Um, I just put up a, an open podium. So if you'd like to join us on stage, uh, if you'd like to follow up with that, just click that teal color box and whoa, and before I even said it, there he is. Good. Woo. Welcome. Hi. How are you? Um, great. So I really feel like I'm thriving better teaching in the asynchronous online environment. Um, but I'm running into an, in, a, an issue where my institution says if you're teaching online, you can't require students to do anything synchronously. So I do a one hour a week synchronous session like you're talking about, but I have to make it totally optional. And I find when I'm doing things that are really engaging that I have this group of students who are coming, um, but that gets kind of smaller and smaller as the semester goes on. And I'm still over here trying to do all my bells and whistles and just, and really make it an, an enriching experience for them. And the students who do come and attend are really expressing that they are finding value in that. I'm just really trying to think about how to get more of those students into the, because I have to make it completely optional because of institutional policies. Mm. Yeah. So let's not get into institutional policies. <laughs> uh, that's bad. But uh, I mean, I, I can see there's, there's, a, there's an equity access potential. Okay, fine. Some, somebody had some good intentions. I'm going to hope. Uh, so, you know, I think from, from your point of view, so the choices are, you know, do more of them so more people can go. But I mean, right, you know, those do the same thing more times in smaller groups, but don't that, do quite as quite sense. as many of them, right? Because if I do it every week, people, this that happens for everything, right? Well, I did that last week. I can skip this week. But if it's a rare occurrence, right? Scarcity is is an influencer. Uh, so do it less often, but then repeat it a few times. 
Uh, the other is, you know, set up, set up an exercise that students need to do with a group of three or a group of four, right? And so, so here, here are the time slots, pick a time slot, come do this. Uh, but this won't work asynchronously and here's why. But you are going to have to convince me that it won't work asynchronously because so much of the world is now asynchronous. Um, you know, I do. I'm seeing this in companies too, right? The people have Zoom fatigue. They have meetings all day long. You know, my large corporate clients, um, they're having fewer meetings. They figured out that, you know, you don't get work done. And so I've, I've taken to saying to people, well, just by the, by the way, if you're a senior leader, meetings are your work. That is actually when you do the work. And so you need better meetings, not sitting behind yourself. If you're the president, you're sitting by the by doing email by yourself all day long. You're probably not leading. Right. So uh, so that means maybe I have more short meetings and I think differently about what I want to accomplish in those meetings. Uh, so, you know, I would think that's that's the approach. I wish I don't have a really good answer. to this. Also, no, but I do like the idea of of um, kind of offering some more choices to them. Because a lot of what I do are things like set up a, a document that we can co-edit or here's a figure. I, I teach science. Here's a figure from your book. Let's annotate this figure and figure out what this visual representation is doing. So I could I could do that same exercise with different groups of people and repeat that. And I, I think that that might get to some of the the issues around, you know, I have this one time on Tuesday late afternoon and if people can't make it, then, then that's their only option. I think, I think moving that around a little bit might be a really good solution. And, and shorter, right? Everything is getting shorter. Movies are getting shorter, people, you know, attention spans. So, you know, doing a 15 or 20 minute or 30 minute most, uh, people are more likely to say, I, I can give up that time yeah. and, and do that. Uh, and get them used to that. But I also want to think you have to convince people that this is something I cannot do asynchronously. And I think there are things that qualify as that, but it's making sure that you really only do those. And it, my, the analogy is also the face-to-face -face classroom. If you want students to come, people say, oh, I videotape my lectures, nobody will come to class. Well, that's true if all your classes do is offer, you know, uh, some other version of something I could do. On, but if my class yeah. is hilarious and, and active and people are running around and it's noisy and messy and all sorts, then, you know, I'm more likely to come. So I like paired assignments where I say, here is the assignment that you need to do. And then when you come to class, we're going to use it in some way. Right. We're now going to, you know, you're going to you're going to create a, an algorithm for what's the best way to, to, to make this experiment. And then we're going to come to class and we're going to have three of them set up and we're going to actually figure out which one works and make real time adjustments. Right. Oh, I'm excited about that. And if you don't come prepared, it'll be meaningless to you. So, right. so we, but now the homework is more engaging <laughs> and the class is more engaging. And so I think that sa same principle works for the synchronous asynchronous. Excellent. Thank you very much. I appreciate sure. it. Sure. Well, thank you for the great question. Um, and again, friends, for, you can see that we're a pretty friendly environment. So if you'd like to follow up with more questions, uh, either hit that Q&A box or join us on stage, just like uh, Valerie just did so nicely. Uh, and we have one question coming up from Ayla Moore. Ayla, I hope I got this correctly. So let me see what you think here. In the hammer and nail framework, how can higher ed address student underpreparedness? without continually creating more one credit courses. Interesting. So because I, I so I use the hammer and nail framework in a very different way. I think I think of the hammers. I think of if disciplines as tools. Right. And the old if, ever, if you know, if, so physics is like a hammer and poetry is like a screwdriver. And so if, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so you want students to have a, a variety of things. So uh, the remedial issue is a hard one. There, there's a great project in Maryland. The Maryland, uh, it's, it's so the, 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 the public institutions in Maryland did a math project uh, where they got rid of all of the sort of one credit remedial courses uh, and they got students into, into courses that counted. By the way, there's also data that says the, the process, the test that you give to put students in remedial or non-remedial, that, that those students are, that those tests are biased by the way that we, we grade them and that looking at other measures put more students into four credit courses and got them onto graduation yeah. earlier than if you yeah. just give them the placement test and say, if you're above a 70, you're here. And if you're, that, that there were, that there are other ways to, to place students into those courses. But, but, the, but the University okay. of Maryland system figured out a way. So what they did was they said, what, what are you interested in doing? 
are, are you interested in, in STEM, in business, in, in philosophy, whatever? And so students, and what's your math background? So they asked them a series of questions and then they said, okay, so we have placed you into this class and this is a math class for business majors. This is a math class for psychology majors. Um, and re so rather than have to have all of these, you know, here is calculus, here's the, you know, all of that, um, they, they found that teaching the math that was discipline specific earlier on was both more motivating, but it also leveled the playing field a bit. And so they were dramatically able to reduce the numbers of remedial courses and get students into courses that counted toward their degree, but also got them on track toward a particular discipline. So it's a really fascinating study. Uh, it's just, it's only a couple of years old. So I expect to see, to see other people doing similar kinds of things. Um, but, but getting a sense of, both of those studies point to getting a sense of what does the student want to do rather than, right, it's not a deficit, rather than a deficit, what, what did you not take in yeah. high school that, that yeah. you need to take? Because the truth is, most people don't need calculus. There, I said it out loud, right? I mean, sure, lots of people do need calculus, but a lot of students don't. And making that a hurdle and making, oh, you've got to get through calculus to be able to do everything on campus, that's not a good thing. And it's also the case that right, a lot of students who could pass statistics or calculus, uh, first generation students of color, end up putting it off. Well, now that just made it worse because now they're forgetting more of their high school math and now they've taken other psychology courses and now they're a senior and they have to take statistics and they're afraid and they've forgotten everything. And that ends up being a disaster. So I, I kind of like meta majors. I think, the first, I think students should not be able to declare a major in the first two years, but they should declare a meta major at some point. Um, one of the mean? other, so a meta major is, you know, I wanna be in STEM somehow, I wanna be in business, you know, I, I have, you know, I have a kind of a general area of interest that I wanna be in. I'm also a big fan of, of you know, first year courses that focus on topics like, you know, poverty or water or, you know, sustainability oh, oh. or something that, that introduce students to a variety of disciplines through a problem. Uh, but we tried a, a nudge experiment at Goucher, which was, um, right, students tell you in their application what they want to do, right? I'm interested in this. I was on the lacrosse team in high school. I'm in the choir, et cetera, et cetera. And then we say to them, right, we know that choice overload is a thing, right? Too many choices. You don't, right? People get overwhelmed. You don't buy as much stuff. You don't, right? Amazon figured this out because putting stuff in your cart is easy. The determining what to buy is hard. And so then you just save for later. Ah, no stress, right? So what's the first thing we do with students in college? Welcome to college. Here are 5,000 courses to choose from. Hey! Right? So we said, okay, look, we know what you're interested in because you told us you wanted to be a psychology major and you took these courses in high school. Here's a schedule. You can change anything you want. It's not binding. You can change courses. But when you give students a default that's not blank, they do much better. It's the same for advising. When you're, when you're, if you have advisees, have them come to you with not five courses they want. Write down the 20 courses that you want and then bring them to me. Because now, right, I can save stuff for later. But now I can say to you, oh, by the way, you should take English because it's a first year course and you should take this and get it out of the way. You should take statistics now because you might want to be it right. But if you say yeah. to students, pick five courses, that's a high stress activity. And it is. There are big consequences. Yeah. Bring me a list of all your courses. So, so, so these are all ways I think to get to get into a, a you know a mindset of how do I figure out where students need help? How do I figure out what they need? Um, but it turns out when you put students into four credit courses, they are more likely to pass because those are courses they count. They're more engaging than those one credit or those no credit courses oh. or those <laughs> those those courses are a disaster for students. We think we're trying to help but they have a high failure rate. And again, studies are that they put the same students into a four credit that counts toward graduation. They do better because they feel better about themselves. And they, they right? Mm. And so how... Mm. Level the playing field a bit. Most... Well, most of that stuff is in the teaching change because there's a lot, a lot of that research is, is in there if you want citations. It's great. Uh, and I have to say, thank you for that excellent, excellent question. And, uh, and Jose, thank you for the, for the really rich response. Uh, 
we, we have uh, time for just another bit more. We had a, uh, um, uh, a we had one question that came actually from a, uh, a former uh, Goucher student who said that they uh, they took um, they liked Goucher because among other things they could take logic from math, uh, which is which is interesting. Uh, but now we have a question from the excellent George Station coming to you from California State University, uh, and he asks nudge question. What about transparency ethics with students? In the Noom app, it's clear they're nudging in uh, Stanford Perks, students don't know. You just nudge them. They'll bring that back up again. Sorry. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, let me just finish that part. In, stu in Stanford Perks, students don't know. You just nudge them with a success video. What's your take? So, so Thaler and Sustein, also, their other name for this was, was, was libertarian paternalism. <laughs> right uh, for nudges because a good nudge doesn't force you to do one thing or another so for example the most famous nudge is the fly in the urinal invented by one of the janitors at Shiphole airport now on the one hand i haven't given i haven't asked your consent right you just walk into the bathroom and there's a fly in the urinal and that means that men are 80 percent more likely to hit the target which means there's less on the floor. There's fewer cleaning supplies used, right? It's, so it's a nudge, right? There's a fly. It's like, oh, maybe I should aim for that. Sorry for the visual. <laughs> so on the one hand, that is, that is, you know, I didn't ask your permission. So I think there are cases where you change the default. So, uh, you know, your taxes, you know, do you want to donate the $3 to this, you know, or, or for example, when you sign up for a new job, I do, I work with a lot of companies, right? The, before the, the, the George, I guess the W. Bush signed the, the act in 2006 for the taxes, right? That a company you had when you got a new job, you had to say, I opt into retirement, right? I want a 401k. Now you can say, welcome to the new job. Your 401k is activated. You can opt out, but you have to come into HR and fill out the form. But they've just reversed it, right? You have to come into HR to fill out the opt out rather than the opt in. Students have to opt out of email rather than opt in. So I, I totally agree that there are ethical questions here about what we're going to do, and we have to think very carefully about it. But I also think if you if you really set up a way that it's not that hard to get people to opt out of things, uh, there are lots of good things you can do. So I would prefer to have all students opt in to getting reminders about assignments. So your yeah. Blackboard, Canvas, whatever you use. The default currently for most of those apps is off, right? Now, when I put an app on my phone, I know that, right, they often say the settings are here. Do you want to opt in, right? It often gives me a choice. So I would say to students, an hour before or a day before or 12 hours before your assignment is due, you get a reminder on your phone that says, hey, you haven't turned in your math yet, and it's going to be late in 10 hours. Yeah, yeah. I would turn that on. I, you know, I think that's libertarian paternalism. You can turn it off, but I've left it on. But at the most part, people are so afraid of that, they leave the default off. And so... I do think we're going to see more of this, but I also think we're going to have to have serious conversations about ethics. And, I, and my view is, is I want to be transparent with students, right? The, these are the nudges that exist. This is why they exist. Noom is a great example, right? What, is the, what does Noom do? Reminders, but it also puts you into a community of other people. I, one of the things I learned, the best way to lose weight is to tweet your weight every day. Oh, yeah. Exactly. It's accountability. It's painful, but it's accountability, right? You can see why it would work and why you wouldn't want to do it. Now, am I going to force you to do that? No. But I do think that uh, the, we, 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 we tend, especially in higher education, to set the defaults to off because we don't want to annoy students. And I think we can set more of the defaults, not all of them, but we can set more of the defaults to on. And one of the ones that I think is a big one is things like reminders for assignments in your, in your, in your LMS app. Yeah. Well, George, what a what a great caution uh, and what a great question. And because I love the way you, you you tear apart all the different ways this can conceivably work. Um, I we have a pause here of questions, and I wanted to take the moderator's privilege and ask uh, one of mine. Um, if if people in higher education adopt all of your recommendations, if they follow the three R's, right, of building up relationships, uh, resiliency, and uh, time for reflection. Uh, if we really take all the learning science seriously that you described, what does higher ed look like, say, five years later? How is it different? 
Well, I think higher ed becomes more relevant, right? It's going to help democracy. It's going to prepare students for an economy of, of jo where jobs are unknown, uh, right? So I think it actually helps higher ed look more relevant and also probably raise its, you know, I mean, the, the numbers have never been worse for the people who think higher ed shouldn't be trusted, et cetera. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, but I think um, higher ed becomes a lot more flexible, right? A lot more focused on lifelong learning, on micro credentials, on, on, mm -hmm. on uh, you know, people continuing to be part of the product. You know, one of the things I, I still think of is that we price things wrong, right? We price things based upon butt time. You know, we're giving the degree to the wrong part of the body, right? It's how much time you sat in your seat, right? The graduation requirement should be based upon when, when can you hold two ideas in your mind at once and without making up your mind? Or when, you're, when, when, you, when have you reached a certain level of cognitive proficiency? And it will take some people longer than others, right? So I think more flexible time, you know, again, the only reason we count credits is because the AAUP and the government wanted to figure out a way to set up retirement plans in the 20s and 30s. And so they needed something they could count, and they could count classroom hours. And so we're still doing that. So I, that doesn't make any sense. We're counting the wrong thing. So I, I think that assessment is going to have to get significantly better. We've got to assess the right things in the right way. But again, it's tennis net. If I had feedback about what students were learning and what was working and what wasn't working, I'd immediately stop doing the things that students are ignoring and aren't working and change my methods. So I do think that there's a great potential for, for both AI and technology to help us get quicker feedback about what's working for students and what's not working for students. Mm -hmm. In the same way, think, think about what happens right when you go to the bathroom now in an airport, and there's the green and the red and the yellow button. And it's like, how was mm -hmm. your experience in our bathroom? Red, yellow, or green? And they get it right. We actually added those at Goucher to like to like the bursar's office, or you went to the financial oh. aid office, right? It's like, right, right. because I want to know: Are you happy? Did, were you treated kindly and with respect? How was your experience with the bursar today, or with the library? Red, yellow, green. So imagine if students were walking out of class going red, yellow, green today, and it's like, mm. wow, today was a red mm. day. Today was not right. You say, wow, today wasn't a good day. I mean, right? I have a sense. I think, oh, today wasn't a good class. But imagine if I got instant feedback after class about what was the best part of class, what didn't work. And I got that all the time. I would be constantly changing my methods. And I think the same is going to be true for students. I think students need a tennis net to know, am I studying the right way? I have a, a study smarter template on my website that's also in this new book, which is, do you give students a chance to reflect about what study techniques work, not just how long? Did you work in groups? Did you work by yourself? Did you, you know, did you do more? Did you do the harder problems? And then students self-reflect on what works and didn't work. But I think technology is going to give us a way to give students, again, a better tennis net to get instant feedback on, you know, I'm rereading the chapter and this is not helping you. Why are you rereading the chapter and highlighting for the fourth time? Stop! Do something else, right? You can more efficiently use your time. So I think we're going to see a lot more learning science and a lot mm -hmm. more faculty development because we're going to have to adapt more quickly. But, but I think the biggest changes we're going to see to higher ed in the next 10 years are going to be in the classroom. Hot, you know, flexibility, uh, more feedback, more AI uh, to help faculty and students do the things that we do better. And we're, the, the pandemic has actually helped us start to see that in the workplace, too. Yes. Some of it is some of it is weird, uh, frankly, and malicious. But but people are getting better feedback about. Oh, I I spent four hours today doing email. I shouldn't have. That's useful information. Well, useful information is what you have just provided for the past hour at top speed and with great passion and verve. Uh, I I hate to wrap things up, Jose, because this is this is so excellent. But we are at the end of the hour. Uh, before I kick you off, let me ask, what's the best way for people to keep up with you? Is it on Twitter? Should they sign up for your site or how? So I'm on LinkedIn, Jose Antonio Bowen. I'm on Twitter at Jose Bowen. I have a, a website, josebowen.com. And I also, teachingnaked.com is its partner website. And I give mm -hmm. away lots of tools. So again, there are templates, mm -hmm. stuff from the book, uh, references. I have actually a whole new section on it, an inclusive teaching uh, you know, bibliography that, that I'm working on that I keep updating uh, so those are the those are the best ways to, to, to keep up with things I'm doing. And uh, I see everybody in cyberspace. Well, that sounds great. Thank you again. This has been fantastic. Thank you Thanks, so much. Brian. Looking Always forward pleasure, to Brian. very much. But don't go away, friends. Let me just uh, point out uh, we have uh, reminders for the next couple of weeks. So looking ahead, 
we have uh, sessions on everything from enrollment and eco-media, digitization, libraries, and neo-nationalism. Again, if you want to sign up for these ahead of time, just go to forum.futureofeducation.us. If you want to keep talking about these issues, everything from the importance of having a tennis net in every class to how nudges might work ethically and practically, just tweet out uh, using FTTEs, the hashtag, or you can tweet at me, at Brian Alexander or at Shindig Events, or head to the blog, brianalexander.org. Uh, if you'd like to dive into the past and look at our previous sessions on everything from, from lighting to assessment to how we change teaching, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. And above all, good luck implementing all these ideas. Please take time to think about them and see how they can improve your teaching and your learning. It's been great talking with all of you. Your questions are terrific. We wish you all the best. Take care, be safe, and we'll see you next time online. Bye-bye.